Millennium Tennis, a powerful title, but consider that tennis is an open skill sport with an often unpredictable opponent across the net. Other open skill sports include football, basketball, soccer, baseball, and volleyball. And among these types of activities, one can easily argue that tennis requires the most complex set of motor skills. Closed skill sports like skating, golf, swimming, and skiing, although they contain their own challenges, have inherently limited interaction. Hi, I'm Joe Dinefer. After attending more than 100 international tennis teacher conferences with nearly 2,000 presentations over the last few years, many leading edge ideas have emerged as trend setting. The purpose of this video is to methodically present these winning ideas along with clear tips on how to most easily practice them. But first, let's discuss four learning and training options. The first option is called dead ball individual practice with the player self-bouncing a ball. The second option is with two players or a coach and a player feeding to one another. The third option for players as they advance is for them to rally together in what's called live ball practice. And although every form of practice has some limitations, overall the most effective and efficient practice method for the broadest level of tennis players is used far too seldom. The fourth option, ball machines. This is surprising when you consider that leading coaches in baseball, volleyball, football, and soccer work with ball throwing devices all the time. I hope that this video can provide at least a small impetus towards more effective practice habits. Now let's share 12 winning coaching trends and use ball machines to facilitate practicing these top concepts. Number one, recognizing blocked, serial, and random practice. Number two, the importance of grooving shots. Number three, shot specificity. Number four, decision-making drilling. Five, directionals. Six, rhythm skill development. Seven, understanding aerobic versus anaerobic training. Eight, effective footwork patterns. Nine, perception and awareness training. 10, tactics and positioning. Number 11, first strike tennis. And number 12, beyond endurance and conditioning. The first issue we'll address is the question of how much time should be spent in blocked, serial, or random practice. Blocked practice is when a player repeats exactly the same shot over and over again. For example, the cross-court topspin forehand our player is now demonstrating. Serial practice consists of a set sequence of shots and repeating that sequence over and over again as we now see our player hitting two deep topspin forehands in a row and then an angled forehand to the cross-court side tee. Another example of serial practice is for several players to hit approach shots and volleys. In this phase of practice, you will also notice that we are using highly visual training aids to assist players in locking in the visual pattern of the shots as well as the physical or kinesthetic skill. A quick word of advice is that after some time with visual aids, perhaps 15 to 20 minutes, it is critical to then remove the aids and have them continue to make sure the players can still visualize their target zones. Finally, there's random practice, which is most similar to match play with live balls instead of fed balls in play. In random practice situations, most coaches just tell players to play points and keep score. However, a more effective practice habit would be to create what I like to call focus issues and through some rule modifications, reward success from specific shots. For example, assuming that the practice session of the day concentrated on cross-court backhands to open up the court, here we see our players in a random exercise with focus on moving their opponents wide on their backhand side. 
We have even extended the backhand side single sideline with the rope zone rope. The rules are simple. If a player pulls their opponent's feet outside that extended sideline, they immediately win two points and start a new point. All other points won score a single point. For less advanced players, try the same drill with the same rules, hitting cross-court mini tennis. Another aspect of top coaching and practicing is to encourage the transition from blocked to serial to random drilling at all levels, not just for more advanced players. Even beginning tennis classes should include random drilling for players to learn how to practice with one another. The only adjustment to ensure success for less experienced players is to have them hit in a more confined area. It is also important to recognize that blocked and serial practices are best accomplished with ball machines and that the 50% overlearning principle should be established. This principle states that to really lock in a skill, players should continue to practice that skill 50% longer than it took them to master it in the first place. However, studies show that practicing beyond that 50% overtraining point can actually have a negative effect. The second concept is the issue of grooving shots. Although players like Bjorn Borg would drill the same old shots for hours on end in practice, many coaches maintain that players should move to random situations as quickly as possible. But remember that repetition of the right things can create a spontaneous performance state known as unconscious competence, critical to overall success. The conclusion? Repetition in practice is good, but it must be mixed in with heavy doses of fun to keep interest high. For example, look at this match play transition drill. Imagine that both players have been grooving their forehands to specific targets over a period of time. Then they play a game of ground stroke singles. Drop shots are not allowed, and they can only hit one backhand per point. This simple, yet fun, high movement drill helps transition them to effective match play. The third Millennium Tennis practice issue to consider is shot specificity. The foundation of this concept is for players to learn and train the optimal shots for any given situation. A simple example we are demonstrating is to hit a cross-court forehand when the ball comes to the forehand side cross-court. However, as a player improves, they must also add the factor of disguise to become less predictable. So, at higher levels, players must train to learn two options for almost any situation, keeping in mind that more is not always better. Studies have repeatedly shown that binary or two-choice decisions are the best method of shot selection in tennis. In fact, more than two choices often result in a decrease in successful performance. For example, here we see our players receiving a short, high ball at midcourt. Instead of considering forehands, backhands, drop shots, and chip or topspin approach shots, these players are taught to only consider two options, a forehand winner to one corner target or the other as defined by our rope zone. These players are not distracted by considering any other options, too many of which lead to indecision and unforced errors. An even more advanced drill for this same issue is to have the coach or partner call out which direction the player should hit their shots only when the ball coming towards them crosses the net. When players can successfully execute this drill, they not only have shot specificity mastered along with an alternative shot, but they have also mastered the ability to disguise their shots.
Now let's move to the concept of decision-making drilling. Once a series of binary shot selections are isolated, the next logical step is for players to try and successfully string several of them together. Here we see our players working off variable feeds, knowing that there are three optional shots which the machine will feed. If it's a short, high, mid-court ball, they will hit a forehand winner down the line or across court. If it feeds a high, deep backhand to the corner, the players will hit cross court with topspin, either deep or cross court to the side tee. In the third option of this sequence, if the machine throws a ball moderately deep to the left of the middle, the players will run around their backhands and hit a forcing shot, either reverse cross court or down the line. And now we see our players putting it all together. They don't know which ball the machine will feed, but they have been training to have two choices for each of the possible three feeds. Targets are set up to provide feedback, and each player hits three balls. Personally, I always like to give players one or two extra hits in a sequence in case they miss their last shot. Finishing with success in short sequences, as well as at the end of workouts, helps build self-confidence. Another exercise to develop quick decision-making abilities is to have players at the net with the machine feeding balls of variable heights. The volleyers are told that if the ball is low over the net, they should aim for depth and control. However, if the ball is high over the net, they are instructed to hit an angled winning volley. We have set up the air zone to initially provide definition as they develop their skills. The use of clearly defined and achievable target areas provides clear and scientifically measurable feedback. However, after increasing their recognition and decision-making abilities, take the air zone line away to help them transition this new skill more easily to match play. This type of practice also helps to effectively develop a player's ball recognition or perceptual anticipation skills. Ball recognition is the player's ability to judge the ball in flight, an essential ingredient to rapid improvement. Working with ball machines allows the coach to work on the same side of the net as the players and guarantees consistent feeds. Plus, it also allows the coach to demonstrate the required skill using a convenient remote switch to turn the machine on and off. The fifth concept in Millennium Tennis is called directionals and how learning certain high percentage directional patterns of play can benefit all players. From the baseline, directionals tell players where to efficiently and effectively hit if they receive an outside ball coming cross court to them and away from their bodies, in which case they would generally hit cross court. However, if a baseline shot is traveling into their bodies or is hit down the line, it is called an inside ball. In this case, the rule of directionals then tells the player to hit away from their opponent and to take the ball early, like a right-handed batter in baseball pulling a ball to left field. This directional pattern of play combines the high percentage tennis principle of hitting a cross-court ball back cross-court along with the aggressive pattern of play of taking a ball early to hit into the open court. And, once again, ball machine feeds with a random pattern of oscillation set the scene for an efficient practice session with these concepts. Here we see our players hitting four balls each, and, depending on the feed, they play the directionals according to high percentage tennis. At competitive levels, a game can be played with points scored for balls hit in the designated target areas. A small word of caution is that while the concept of directionals creates a solid reference of percentage tennis, 
players should not become totally predictable either. The next Millennium Tennis concept we have selected is rhythm skill development, since every single tennis ball comes with a unique speed across the net. For purposes of analysis and understanding, let's break these speeds into slow, medium, and fast relative to each player's ability. Each incoming speed requires a different response. The first step, however, is to figure out a player's personal rally speed. Coaches can easily determine the rally speed of a particular player by timing several shots with the players hitting as fast a pace as possible without losing consistency. Then match the machine or feed tempo to a player's natural rally speed for general drilling or use the rally speed as a reference point to create more challenging drills or to create opportunities for players to play aggressively against slower balls. If the ball is fed at a player's average ball or rally speed, they will want to return it at the same pace. Strategically, they are patiently waiting for a slower ball or shorter ball to take advantage of. If the incoming ball comes at a faster speed, then they move to respond with a more defensive shot with focus on depth to keep their opponents from gaining a tactical advantage. And if it comes in at a slower speed, a player needs to recognize that slower speed as an opportunity to execute a more offensive shot. Once they've mastered the individual responses, try drilling the players against an assortment of speeds to teach them to play against various types of opponents. Even for beginning players, it can be extremely productive to introduce them to various speeds early in their development. The result is always a more versatile and adaptable player. An additional tool for developing improved rhythm is through the use of music with different rhythms. Studies have proven that music can significantly enhance the learning of sports skills. Another important detail relating to rhythm is for players and coaches to remember to adjust the rhythm of the feeds to the positions of the players on the court. For example, when a player is at the net, they require a feed timed entirely different than if they were hitting balls from the baseline. The machine should feed the next ball when the player's hit passes the opening of the machine. Now our players are demonstrating the more complicated rhythm of the approach and volley. Notice that the feeds have been adjusted to accurately replicate the rhythm of live ball drilling. All too often, coaches, whether using a machine or feeding by hand, maintain the same feeding frequency whether a player is on the baseline or at the net. This mistake can actually be detrimental to player rhythm and advancement. Now let's address the aerobic versus anaerobic debate. A recent finding sheds more light than ever before on this question. The study has proven that the benefits of aerobic exercise are contained within the benefits of anaerobic exercise, such as tennis. You see, the anaerobic features of tennis are powerful, since an average three-set tennis match requires an astonishing three to five hundred different energy bursts. Let's now move to one of my favorite teamwork conditioning drills. The first conditioning drill encourages both teamwork and communication, with players on the baseline receiving random feeds. After each hit, players switch sides, and when a team hits four total balls in the designated target areas, which in this case is the area outside of the rope zone diamond, they rotate with the next team. Keep in mind that endurance style drills like these should generally last 10 to 15 seconds to both maintain player focus and effectively develop tennis specific strength and endurance. Top coaches also recommend establishing a work-rest ratio in practice of about one to three or one to four, since tennis players actually rest in between points in a real match situation. Ball machine practice with several players rotating on and off the court 
actually simulates real tennis situations quite well. In this drill, our players are hitting a three-shot combination, an attacking ground stroke, an approach volley, and then a winning angled volley. After their turn, they move to the outside and to the end of the other line. Like many sports, movement on a tennis court, or eye-foot coordination, as it's sometimes called, consists largely of three-step movement patterns, such as you see here on the baseline. In fact, almost the entire baseline area can be covered with the three steps we are now demonstrating. Even at the net, many top players also use this footwork pattern on wide volleys for optimal court coverage. The key is starting with what is called the step out pattern that calls for the first step to be with the foot closest to the ball. One more recent footwork development is called the double rhythm. One example is on short balls when a player moves in to push off with the front foot and then lands on that same front foot again. Yet another example of the double rhythm is on wide balls to help a player more quickly recover for the next shot. A very consistent feed is essential to most easily practice footwork patterns since it allows the player to clearly focus on the footwork issues and not worry about variations in the incoming balls. The next footwork pattern of Millennium Tennis is called the jab step which is used primarily for running forwards or backwards. Here we see our baseline player responding to a drop shot. Notice that in order to push off in the direction of the ball as quickly as possible, the first step is actually backwards. Now the same player is at the net and has to run back for a lob. Again, the jab step is essential for a quick response. The first step is now forward to build up the elastic energy in the leg to push off powerfully. The next logical exercise to practice the jab step in a more random type of drill is to alternate feeding lobs and drop shots. Notice that when the coach is free from feeding to instruct the players, the drill can be stopped in an instant with a simple remote control unit. Then. After a brief tip from the coach, play can resume quickly without any loss of focus or concentration. The final footwork exercise deals with the principle of closing in towards the net. One analogy of the movement is for the player to think of moving up a funnel. We have placed throw down lines to guide player movement on angles towards the net. This successfully gets them to take the ball earlier thus giving their opponents less time to react. And it also cuts down on their own movement since they will get to the ball sooner as compared to moving parallel to the baseline. In this situation, our players are alternating ground strokes. They move into position at the bottom of the funnel with a split step and then close in towards the net to hit the shot. In addition to regular ground strokes, this funnel principle can be used for first volleys as we see here. And finally, the funnel principle can also be used for returning serves as our players are now demonstrating. This new Aluma lift sure makes it fun and easy. In open motor skill sports like tennis, perception and ball recognition are essential skills. Although matches create the most realistic situation, certain training techniques can also help develop these critical skills. For example, to develop opponent awareness while drilling with a machine, have a partner behind the machine moving at the last second to one side or the other. The goal is for the hitter to direct the ball away from the moving opponent. 
another exercise which focuses on ball recognition, focus, and quick decision skills is to put different color balls into a ball machine. Assign each color ball a different shot selection. A simple example would be for the player to hit all yellow balls down the line and all two-tone balls cross court. This drill is one of those ideas that can become literally hundreds of different drills all by itself. This next section of Millennium Tennis is called Tactics and Positioning. In this portion of the video, we'll share several drills and concepts that relate to both singles and doubles play. Let's begin with a double situation drill with an angled feed starting the point. Although most players understand lateral movement and court position in doubles, teams often face the problem of not moving into the correct position early enough. In this drill, players on the same side as the feed start in the service box closest to the feeder or the machine. On the opposite side, players start in the shifted position nearest the feed as well, prepared to cover the down the line shot. After the feed, the point is played out. If the coach is using the machine as we are here, the remote control easily turns the feed on and off. This is also an example of a drill where more than four players can easily be accommodated on one court on a rotational basis. This next exercise starts with the machine introducing either a lob or volley to a team at the net. The opposing team must start on the service line and, depending on the difficulty of the feed, they either move forwards, backwards, or hold their position. This is another fast-paced doubles drill that can easily accommodate up to four teams rotating in and out. Communication should be encouraged among players of both teams as they move forwards and backwards together to cover their playing area. Another fast-paced but basic drill works on players neutralizing their opponent's offensive position when they are on the service line. With one team on the service line and opposing teams rotating against them, points are played out until one team wins two points against the volleyers. The goal is obviously for the baseliners to hit to the feet of their opponents and try to take over the net. Still another tactical doubles drill focuses on what to do when one team gets stuck in a one-up, one-back position. It's critical that the up person on the split position team reads the opponent's possible shots and moves accordingly to either a defensive or offensive coaching situation. The final drill for this section is another high activity teamwork drill for doubles. Each team starts at the net and receives three feeds. The first is a lob requiring communication and cooperation as they run back together. The second feed is short, leading them to the net and the final feed is intended for them to volley as a winner. First strike tennis is a catchy way to describe today's style of competitive play. Aggressive, like a one-two punch in boxing. With this style of play, athletes simply look for the first opportunity possible to hit an aggressive and dominating shot to put an opponent on the defensive. Statistics show that top players hit many more winners per match in today's tennis than in previous decades. And although their unforced errors percentage has also increased, everyone feels it's statistically a good trade-off and worth the risk. To begin developing this first strike approach, players have to try hitting harder than they feel they can control. This inevitably leads to multiple errors and players need to be assured that this is to be expected. One way to accelerate what I like to call the progression of aggression is to have players actually aim to hit the back fence to get a feel for maximum racket acceleration. In this stage, encourage them to use their full bodies in the swing 
from their legs all the way up through hip, torso, and shoulder rotation. In the high-tech language of today's tennis, this is called maximizing both linear and angular momentum. Then, after they are able to consistently hit the back fence, have them aim for a target area six to 10 feet behind the baseline, but make sure they have the same racket speed as when they were hitting the back fence. And finally, set up a target area inside the baseline, but deep in the court, and have the players maintain the same racket speed as when they were aiming for the back fence. The result is inevitably a lot more pace than they are used to, and the balls start landing in, with the players adding more and more topspin or control alongside their tremendous racket acceleration. To tactically practice this first strike approach, we now have four players alternating two hits each with the ball machine. Set up target areas in the corners, and players score points by hitting two balls in a row in the designated areas. In this pattern, they expect to force weak shots with a very aggressive ground stroke, and then hit winners on their very next opportunity. The ball machine or feeder hits moderate pace balls allowing players to aggressively take control of the point. And for the most advanced players, to ensure that they don't slow down by hitting too much topspin and arc, we have also set up an air zone. We simply tell our players that they must hit below the horizontal line as well as deep. This automatically forces them to maintain or even pick up the pace. If a variable shot ball machine is available, Set the machine to feed the first ball fairly deep and the second ball short and weak to really simulate a game situation. Another important aspect of first strike tennis is to work on the return of serve. Thanks to the ingenious Playmate Alumalift, we are now able to easily work on returning serve with the first strike attitude just by setting up target areas and competition among a few players. Just set up challenging but achievable target areas and award points for success. Especially with service returns, players often benefit from using primary air target windows rather than merely secondary targets all the way on the other side of the net. Any way you look at it, the return of serve is one of the most important shots in the game and also one of the least practiced. Our final drill situation for first strike tennis is for a ball machine or feeder to simulate the return of serve. The role of the server's partner at the net is to be in motion constantly to make a first strike, and their two choices are to either poach or fake. They then deal with the random feeds of the machine. The coach or an extra player has the remote switch for the machine, and only one point at a time is played out. Players can rotate positions after a certain number of points and cumulative points can be tracked for each team. Our final section in Millennium Tennis is called Beyond Endurance and Conditioning. You see, tennis is among the most physically challenging sports in the world. The player of the next millennium will be more fit, pound for pound, than players of previous eras. And Unique to the next millennium, players and coaches will focus on more than simple endurance and conditioning. The player of tomorrow will take a holistic approach to the evolution of his or her entire energy system development. Areas of focus will expand to include endurance, power and speed, plus balance, agility, and high-end reactions and reflexes. Here are a few drills that may become commonplace exercises for the player of tomorrow. First, let's use the consistent feeds of a programmable ball machine to work on one of the toughest, yet most traditional conditioning drills, the overhead and volley combination. We have formed two lines of players with alternating lob and volley feeds. The rules are that no balls are allowed to bounce and each player hits eight balls before rotating. Set up target areas as we have to provide clear feedback 
as well as an opportunity to score points to allow the players to compete either individually or as teams. Now let's see our players work on foot speed with a power ladder. After every two volleys, have the players recover and quick step through an agility ladder. Another benefit of this type of exercise is that more than two players can be easily and productively occupied while using a ball machine. This is an example of multitasking at its best. Another high purpose training development is to combine resistance training with hitting tennis balls. Here we see two of our players hitting short high balls while moving against heavy resistance. Still another natural option is to use the same power band to work on closing in at the net for volleying. These are the types of exercises that will make tennis conditioning more fun and highly effective for the next millennium. So, after covering these 12 cutting edge tennis developments, just what is Millennium Tennis? It's clearly a global approach, helping players to master the most efficient technique, to employ the most effective tactics, to develop the greatest physical speed, strength, and agility, and to establish the strongest possible mental components, alert, positive, enjoying the battle. And perhaps equally important, Millennium Tennis is fun. Thank you for joining us. Hello, I'm Joe Dinefer. After 28 years of teaching tennis and attending hundreds of coaches' workshops, I'm excited to share with you Ball Machine Breakthrough, tennis's first how-to for today's ball machine technology. Although this is not a video for the beginning ball machine user, we still want to start with a few user safety concerns. First, check ball speed before using. Second, don't walk in front of the operating machine. Third, only use standard tennis balls. Four, don't try to outlast the machine. Tens of thousands of tennis ball machines of all shapes and sizes can be found in facilities around the world. However, according to our research, they are largely underused. We surveyed students of all levels concerning ball machine use in lessons and workouts. The overwhelming majority wanted ball machines as part of almost any tennis lesson. The two main reasons cited were Ball machines allow the pro to have personal contact with the students instead of merely calling out instructions across the net, plus the consistent feeds from the machine encourage shots to be easily grooved. Of course, there are other benefits a ball machine specifically offers the coach. These include one, consistency of feeds. Two, saving the pro's energy so he or she can put that energy into the quality of the instruction. Three, helping 
to efficiently run multiple court workouts. Four, helping the pro to easily organize group lessons or workouts with uneven numbers of players. And five, it facilitates video replay. Personally, I've always viewed ball machines as an assistant pro who is eager to hit with my students and they never get tired. This video is designed to benefit both coaches and tennis players. Anyone interested in putting today's technology in ball machine use on their side of the net. Part two covers the role of ball machines in accelerating the learning process. The best teachers in the world have several things in common. They establish excellent rapport with their students. They use a principle called guided discovery to help their students become self-sufficient. They use the best available teaching tools. They adapt to various size groups with ease and they use video replay frequently. First, the best teachers develop excellent rapport and personal relationships with their students. However, the standard group tennis lesson involves pro feeding with the teacher calling out instructions from across the net. It looks like this. On the other hand, ball machines encourage close interaction between coaches and students. Let's call this format Pro Freedom, where the coach is free to rove and make corrections privately to each person. Remember the old saying, praise in public, but correct in private. The best teachers use the principle of guided discovery as the basis of their coaching. The students need to reach their own conclusions through reason, logic, and experience. Then, on their own, they become self-sufficient problem solvers instead of dependent learners waiting for their teachers to feed them new information. The consistent feeds of a ball machine definitely facilitate guided discovery. Next, the best teachers use the best available teaching tools to accelerate the learning process. In this video, we use some of the best available ball machines in the world today, state-of-the-art video technology, and the popular and highly visual target systems called the Rope Zone and the Air Zone. These target systems provide immediate visual feedback, encouraging the player to recognize the four basic tennis errors and how to make adjustments. The four major errors are out, in the net, to the right of the target, and to the left. Players should always make intelligent errors, seldom making the same mistake two times in a row. The best teachers adapt to various size groups with ease. Ball machines are absolutely excellent in workouts with an odd number of players. The best teachers remain free to rove among all of the players and use machines to round out the group. And, finally, the best teachers in the world frequently use video replay. In particular, the new technology and video cameras with non-reflective, built-in color screens and slow motion replay are a perfect companion to ball machines in accelerating the learning process. Whether in a lesson or practicing alone, players can film and review themselves in seconds, right on the court. Part three of this tape carries us into the creative, drilling aspect of ball machine use. The drills we have selected apply very much to today's style of play. You'll quickly see how each of the following drills expands into practically unlimited variations. They can also be adapted to all levels of play by adjusting any or all of the following three variables. First, the difficulty of the incoming ball. Second, 
the size of the target area, and third, the amount of player movement to the ball. You will also notice that we are setting up both repetition drills to groove shots and virtual reality drills to test that same shot under competitive pressure. The first drills can be adapted to many ball machines. The one we are using, the Matchmate Coach, is able to adjust six variables, velocity, spin, axis of spin, frequency, oscillation, and trajectory. All of these drills operate smoothly with the consistent feeds that ball machines offer. Gone are the days of hitting only forehands if the ball is on the right side of the court and backhands for balls on the left half. Instead, developing a dominating weapon has proven more effective. This drill emphasizes the movement and skills needed to develop the forehand as a real weapon. Players aim for the rope zone targets in the deep corners and hit two shots each. A virtual reality drill for the same exercise would be to score one point for each ball in the rope zone. Another tactic in today's game is to take the ball early, not necessarily hitting harder, but contacting the ball on the rise further inside the court. Here we set up a four ball oscillation, setting up the rope zone just behind the baseline to guide hitter movement. Players have to stay in front of the rope zone. On the other side, we have set up side to side target areas. Players are instructed to only switch targets when they have hit one of the sides three times in a row. This drill focuses on playing what used to be called no man's land. In today's tennis, more and more balls are played from this area, but seldom is mid-court play practiced. Low volleys, half volleys, high volleys, and short ground strokes can be practiced and players have to remain in the rope zone area created in the mid-court. This is an exercise for all levels of play since beginners inadvertently get stuck here and advanced players attack from the baseline and move into this area to take charge of the point. Closing out points quickly is the mark of successful play. In this moderate to heavy movement drill, two to three players can be easily accommodated side by side. The rope zone is set up for the players to aim for the sides of the court. After each shot, players move back to touch the service line. The machine frequency is set up to keep everyone moving and the players are encouraged to contact the ball as close to the net as possible. If needed, set up a movement guide rope, forcing the players to cross the rope and close in tight to the net on each shot. This fast-paced shot combo drill is always a favorite. Balls land short to encourage approach shots. Target areas are set for down-the-line approach shots and angled cross-court volleys. Movement and position guides can also be established. Here we have set up boxes which the players move into to volley. The logical virtual reality drill is to score points for each combination where both balls land in the correct target area. For more advanced players, the air zone can also be added. Doubles points end quickly, at least for better players. Less experienced players hesitant to close out points will particularly benefit from this drill. The machine is set to feed challenging return of serves down the middle and the server's partner takes the shot. After that, the point is played out with all players converging at the net. For better players, the air zone can be set up and all balls must pass below the horizontal line. Rotations can take place every four points or regular games can be scored. A favorite of mine for many years, 
This drill is very intense and requires sensitivity that both the frequency and speed of the feeds match the ability of the players. More advanced players can be required to touch the side tee between shots and close in across the rope zone boundary towards the net as we are demonstrating. The final section of drills introduces some of the newest technology in ball machines. The machine used is the Ultimate Coach by Matchmate, which allows up to six completely different shots to be programmed in sequence, including slice and kick serves. With this machine, we are only limited by our imagination. Time is short in tennis particularly at the net. In this drill, our new state-of-the-art machine throws a variety of arcs and speeds. Volleyers recover to touch the service line between shots. The air zone is set up to help them recognize when they can go for winners. When they see the ball arcing over the air zone, they go for angled winners. When the ball arcs low over the net, they aim for depth and control with their volleys. Rope zone target areas are set up for both depth and angles. For intermediate level players and above, ball placement, including varying depth, is critical to winning matches. In this drill, the rope zone is set up in the diamond pattern as the area to avoid. The machine is programmed to feed many different types of shots and players are challenged not only by moving to the ball, but placing their returns with angles, depth, or drop shots. A virtual reality drill is to let players stay in until they miss. The player who stays in the longest by time or numbers of balls hit is the winner. One of the few serving machines available, this new coach machine can serve any type of serve you can imagine. And, thank goodness, no opponent will serve with such consistency. In this exercise, program up to six varieties of serves and have the players verbally commit in advance where they are planning to hit their returns. The rope zone is set up for cross-court or down-the-line commitments. And, for more advanced players, set up the air zone, requiring placing the return less than three feet over the net. This is a longtime favorite of many teaching pros to build the skills necessary to close out points in singles and develop stamina. Until this new ball machine technology, this drill had to be fed by the pro. Let's see how this machine handles one player and then two at a time. The rope zone is set up so players have to hit one side of the court or the other. A good virtual reality drill is for each player to get 20 balls and the player with the most overheads and volleys landing in the target areas wins. This drill suits the games of many competitive juniors. Players hit two ball combinations. The first ball is fed fairly deep by the machine and the player is instructed to counter punch with a deep top spin drive into the deep rope zone target area. The next feed is short and high, representing the weak return elicited from their driving ground stroke. The player moves in to take this sitter and drive it into either rope zone target area. Two, three, four or more players can be easily accommodated with this drill. Our final drill is the one to end your workouts. At least your players should feel finished after this one. The machine is programmed to feed six very different balls intended to move the players as much as possible to all corners of the court. Players are instructed that all balls from the machine must be allowed to bounce. They stay in until they hit a certain number over the net and in the court. This forces them to concentrate well despite fatigue since they cannot stop 
until they accomplish the goal. Stronger players will require more challenging feeds, which our new ball machine is only too happy to offer. Thank you for letting us share this with you. Ball Machine Breakthrough, tennis's first how-to for today's technology.